So welcome everyone. Uh, this is actually the eighth webinar that we are doing under the series uh, Kriya Engage. Uh, and today we have uh, the vibrant, uh, the ever so popular uh, Professor Swarna Malja Ganesh with us. Swarna, thank you so much uh, for agreeing to do this with us. Um, thank you and welcome. Thank you so uh, uh, so, uh, so Anna, just to update you, um, we have audiences from, you know, more than 100 cities who've registered, uh, you know, from about eight or nine countries. Uh, so there are teachers, parents, uh, students, principals, counselors, all of them, right? So these are uh, sessions that are open to everyone. Um, and, and uh, you know, unlike uh, typical outreach season when we are all out there, we are going to schools, you know, maybe doing smaller sessions with one school or two schools. Um, I think this coronavirus and the COVID has actually pushed us, uh, you know, to getting into digital and, and having no boundaries, really. Uh, so we have people from all over the world signing up for this. Uh, so welcome again. Uh, and I'll just quickly introduce uh, Professor Swarna to all of you. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen her work, have known her, uh, but Professor Swarna is a, you know, she's an assistant professor of practice. Uh, and, and to all of you who don't know what uh, professor of practice means, uh, these are people who are practicing professionals highly regarded uh, in their disciplines, but who also take time uh, to teach. Uh, so she's an assistant professor of practice in the literature and the arts department. Uh, so Swarna is actually, you know, a combination of many, many things, uh, like most of the faculty members at CREA. Uh, so I don't know uh, how how all of these people manage to do so many things, right? So Swarna is a combination of a performer with over 35 years of experience, uh, a scholar of dance history. Uh, she's a trained academician in uh, academician in art practice. Also short also uh, an Indian TV actress uh, and a TV anchor, uh, trained Bharatanatyam dancer who performed uh, at many stages across the world. Um, her PhD dissertation was on research and reconstruction of uh, lost dance of the medieval South India, uh, specifically the Nayak period. Uh, as a Fulbright Nehru Fellow uh, for Academic and Professional Excellence, Swarna uh, Malia went to uh, UCLA to teach and pursue uh, postdoctoral research. She's trained in Indian and Middle Eastern music, epigraphy, history, archaeology. Uh, she's received prestigious awards uh, and fellowships for her contributions. Uh, she's the director of Ranga Mandira Academy of the World Dance uh, slash Performance and the Indic Studies, where she works at providing education and performing arts. Uh, further research interests include Sadar as a subaltern form of Bhartanatyam uh, through gender, culture, society, stigma, and political movements. In her professional capacity, uh, she has uh, designed and taught courses uh, such as past performing uh, practices, art as history, and women in performance, uh, literature and media, which cover uh, archival writing practices, performance in the study of body and culture uh, as a lived experience. So, Arna, how did you get time to do all of this? I, do, I mean, I don't know. And, and you know, I've really picked up a few things from your profile. I don't know how you, you know, all of you at CREA managed to do so much, but, but Swarna, before you begin uh, with the wonderful, wonderful topic that you've given us, uh, I would like you to spend about five minutes to tell us about your journey and what inspired you, what were the ups and downs, you know, what brought you here today? Uh, thank you, Vikram, at the very outset. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with you, Kanchi, who is, you know, who's directing this whole endeavor. Uh, and the, of course, the IT support team who are always the backbone of all that Kriya, uh, at Kriya we do. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to connect through Kriya with uh, students and um, educationists and academicians and really the larger populace of people who are uh, looking at education today as a um, as a, as a gateway to understanding life, uh, you know, for a very long time, I think all of us, at least a generation or two, uh, you know, post independence, uh, were looking at education as a gateway to growth and to self growth and towards economic upliftment and rightfully so, because that's where we were left. Uh, you know, in our uh, early pre in post independence uh, times, but I think times have also called for us to go back and revisit our own purpose for education and that 
brings us right back to some of the practices that we've we've already had and you know it very strange that you keep saying multitasking about the faculty. True that Priya faculty are very, very diverse in their interests. Um, every one of the faculty, that's one thing that I truly admire in all, our, all my colleagues. But it's also true that all of you, all of us really, the, even the young people, right? We're all juggling many, many hats. And we do it almost effortlessly. If you look at a homemaker, for example, right? She juggles so many hats in a day she he whoever that homemaker may be right they juggle so many hats it's just that we don't we haven't learned to acknowledge those as skills or or as labor so i think um, that said uh, the fact that i do these things brings me to br brings me to the story of why i arrived at kriya so one of kriya's key principles is interwovenness. I'm sure you've seen that on our website and I'm sure we've all been, wherever you meet any Kriya person, we would start the gyan about um, interwoven. But what really is interwoven? I think um, the reason why I chose to share this session today and I titled it uh, the way I titled it, it may sound very interesting, it's a storytelling, but I think through the course of this conversation, I hope to bring to you how how not disciplines, but people's lives and interests are all deeply stitched together. It is almost impossible to find those strands. Yes, we can find those strands and appreciate it, but in totality, it's only when in totality that we absorb, can it actually translate into knowledge, and it's only that kind of knowledge that can ever permeate into being the kind of education that we need today. And therefore, I think, um, uh, as exciting and entertaining as story narration sounds, we will understand through that fun and approachable medium what it is to have a window to the very many disciplines that otherwise seem slightly farther away from our everyday reach. So that's really the crux of uh, what I'm going to do today, as well as the very reason why I arrived at Priya. I mean, the fact that you know, Kriya manages to acknowledge practice. I'm also a trained academician, but that aside, my practice really, you know, takes up so much of my life and my space. My academics is fed by my practice. And the fact that an academic institution, uh, I, I would say almost the first institution in India that begins to recognize practice as another form of knowledge practice. I think that's very key. And that really will turn the tables, not just in performance. I mean, I don't think practice at Kriya is only to performance. We have science practitioners, scientists. We have people from the field. So that makes, that makes for the mix of faculty and the academic approach very hands-on. That's the shot of everything. So I'm going to quickly introduce the topic that you've given us. You know, the time that you shared it with me, I was the most excited. I think this is the most exciting titles that we've received from anyone. Uh, so it's it's Konisar Khan and his courtiers, uh, story of politics, history, sustainability, and art. Uh, it'll really be interesting for us to see how you bring all of this together. Uh, so through actually a, a dramatic storytelling, uh, Professor Swarna will showcase uh, the historicity of art making, uh, that's painting, architecture, poetry, music, and dance, uh, and how really politics, history, restoration, and sustainability, uh, when placed at the intersection of each other, reveal their shared meanings that call for us to see life as interwoven uh, temporalities. I mean, Swarna, this is amazing. Please, please take uh, it from here. Well, yes, as fancy as all of that sounds, I'll just break it down to all of you. I'm going to share with you um, a simple but very exciting story. So in the next few minutes, we will go through a narrative. I'll try to dramatize it as much as possible. I'm going to still sit in my chair. I'm not going to walk around and I'm not going to. So it's almost like a play reading. Uh, so you will grasp the story through that. But uh, keep your ears open also for the strands of multiple disciplines and different kinds of knowledge streams that feed into making this story. And I think that's where we'll come back perhaps when we start discussing and perhaps when Vikram starts, uh, you know, posting some questions to me. Um, there is going to be all of those things that he said, uh, but there will also be some some more things. So if you if you are um, keen and listening, then I think we'll be able to journey in this together. Um, I want to begin by saying that uh, when we start talking about 
uh, interwovenness, we also have to think about the people who intervene. They are really the crux of inter. If you can't have things intervene, it is the people and the minds that intervene. So for this very small presentation as it is that I'm going to make, you would still see that not only so many disciplines have come, but it's the people from those disciplines that have uh, in ways that are so intrinsic collaborated with me on this. So they haven't, they haven't contributed directly to the making of this narrative, but their individual work in their disciplines has been sort of a learning from learning. So at CREA, we have something called learning to learn, and therefore this is one classic example of that. So I want to begin by acknowledging the, the, the voices and bodies of people whose work has contributed to this narrative. Uh, I want to acknowledge Mr. Anwar. I want to acknowledge Nivedita Lewis. I want to acknowledge Dr. S. Sharada, Professor Subaraman, uh, KJ Dilip, and Ila Sangeeta as well as my own work. So you see right there, you have people of different faiths and from different, different really disciplines have come together. Okay, that said, now we'll go directly into the narrative. No more Swarnamalia, we will only listen to the voices from the story. The year was second, I, I hope my screen can be right? Cool, whenever I want. Got it. One second, please. Okay. Yes, and we begin. The year was 1790. A party of men, Hindu and Muslim courtiers of Nawab Sadatullah Khan, led by his prime minister, Dhakani Ram were returning on their horses to Arkad, the new capital base of the Nawab of Karnatik. That was indeed a great reception, exclaimed Hakim. Yeah, yeah, except the food. Did you notice the bread? It was like stone. And did you eat, what did they call it? A uh, curry. <laughs> Kori, mocked Kisil Khan, a courtier. <laughs> they call it Kori. Don't know what it means, Kori. Indeed, our old Ali Bhai from Huzur Nawab's Khadsama is serving General Joseph Collette now. He's serving him really well, said Jaswant Rai, another courtier. Mim Saab, Mim Saab, Mim Saab, Mim Saab, he says. Allah, Allah, what can one say about that treacherous General Joseph Collette and his bottomless wine glass? Haram, haram, exclaimed Muhammad Arif. Dakni Ram immediately added, thank God for that Rogan ghost that we turned in turn served from our Nawab's kitchen. It was splendidly tasty, wasn't it? Of course, it is now our speciality, once picked up from Farooq Siyad, our Mughal Bacha's kitchen. But nevertheless, it is ours now. Anyway, the feast was after all a feast in honor of our peace treaty with those company fellows. So peace be upon all of us. Dhakini Ram just then said, look, whether our stomachs were full or not, our coffers have become fuller. Mine by a thousand pagodas and Nawab's by two thousand pagodas from this peace treaty. So shush. But at what cost? Roared Fazullah. We were triur, our stronghold. We had to give that up for this peace treaty. Huzur, in spite of our large army, I still don't know how we lost the battle to that Lieutenant John Roach. Shh. Let's not continue to talk about our defeats, I say. Enough. There is peace now, at least for now. Let us return to our card and report to our Nabab about this feast. Then Muhammad Arif said, you see, we have enjoyed the hospitality of the British, but on our way, the Armenians have invited us. They want to extend their hospitality. Uh, there is this Koja Pedris Uskan, 
he's a very rich armenian trader sir and his bungalow is at the foothills of pirangi hills it's here on the way oh yes exclaimed hakni ram i have heard of this pedris saab i believe he has renovated the church of saint thomas mount let us pay him a visit do you know that the apostle saint thomas was actually perhaps killed there in that mount in 72 ad well at least that's what i have heard salam alaikum pedra saab your feast was indeed generous but we have another request you know that our nawab sadatullah khan saab is a great connoisseur of the arts now he told us to go and inspect the newly commissioned paintings by all the rich armenians inside the st thomas church do you mind if we go up why not why don't we go said pedris to a 160 steps up the hill now you have indeed made this trip memorable exclaimed all the courtiers as they went up Oh, your lofty roof! Look at these elegant aisles, and and those glossy pictures. The picture of Jesus Christ and the apostles and Venus. I am dazzled! Exclaimed Kisil Khan. picture of virgin mary and jesus christ with translucent oil glazes these paintings produce brilliant jewel like colors when oh, the glossy surface my goodness get those symbolic meanings there is light there is shadow Oh my god the great psychological penetration va va the renaissance painting style from europe has indeed captured our hearts what wonderful paintings particularly the ones on the roof are beyond all praise from whichever corner we see they seem to be looking at us our eyes are dazzled subhan allah subhan allah everybody is killed and mohammad arif who was watching this in absolute silence broke into an urdu verse his eyes the artist's eyes see with the eye of god the whole art of the west is manifested in the twinkle of that eye sabash va 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 Why don't we all hold a mushaira, a poetic symposium, right here, Pedris Sab? Is that okay with you? Of course, amen to that, Pedris said. And thus, that evening, under the sun, under the roof of biblical Renaissance paintings at St Thomas Church, sat the Hindu and the Muslim courtiers of Sadatullah Khan. thus began their gathering kisil bash khan fazullah khan aha mohammad mukhim jaswant rai and several others gathered in their fine clothes under the umbrella of these beautiful renaissance paintings jesus and mary looking down upon them basant rai who was the brother of jaswant rai began to sing the eye has not eyed like unto the beloved from the west the moon has not witnessed another such moon in the whole of that country hey hey let me continue basant rai chimed mohammad arif and he sang the european beloved has struck such a chord in my heart that the page of my heart has been metamorphosized into a picture of europe
Khizil Basha Khan looked around at the people of all faiths, Portuguese, Armenian, Christians, Muslims, and Hindu courtiers. He then gazed up at the ceiling to marvel at baby Jesus and his angelic face and began his recital. I am not able to differentiate between a sheikh and a Brahmin. I am really unable to differentiate between a sheikh and a Brahmin. For there is a parda, a veil, under which lies not the face, but the ignorant mind. Oh, what that, when that veil lifts, I am indeed not able to differentiate between a sheikh and a Brahmin. Mujhe malum na tha. Shall we all go and see those historic paintings that brought people of all faiths together on that beautiful day? Aren't you all dying to see those paintings? Let me take you there. You'd want to see this, right? But this is what you're going to see. If you go to St. Thomas Church today, my friends, this is what you're going to see. Alas, this is all we have left from that great moment in history where faiths merged, people came together, food and culture and art and customs, all of it was bound together through poetry, paintings, and art. Renaissance painting from the West, a Khanazar Khan and his courtiers from here, go to an Armenian merchant who had commissioned these biblical paintings on the ceiling of St. Thomas Church, which is left in this bereft manner for all of us today. Thank you. Vikram, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Swarna. And I think uh, people had some issue with the volume uh, and oh. the music, but but whatever we could see, I mean, it was. Thank you so much on this journey. Uh, it was absolutely delightful. Uh, 
Um, I'm so sorry that there were some issues. I would have really liked for everybody to uh, see things better. Too bad, no? Uh, no, we would also. But anyways, I think, you know, moving forward and, and what we'll do, uh, so Arna, is we'll invite you to another session uh, huh. and maybe, maybe, maybe do this more, right? <laughs> and I think, I think everyone should chat and write it in the comment box saying they want to see her again. Uh, so we'll get her back. Uh, but now uh, I think so we're now moving to, uh, you know, a dialogue. Um, yeah. I had, you know, while I was listening to you uh, and, and, and seeing what you were talking and, and such beautiful stories, uh, you know, there were some questions that were coming to my mind. Uh, so before, uh, you know, we take questions, questions that have come to us uh, during the registration, by the way, everybody who's online now, we have, over 150 people, um, whatever questions you have for uh, Professor Swarnamalia, you can type it in the Q&A box uh, and we'll take those questions quickly and try to answer as many as possible. Uh, but before that, uh, Swarna, there were a couple of things that I had in my mind. So, you know, we've lost these paintings now. Uh, you've shown us the church. I mean, it was heartbreaking, uh, you know, because, you know, as you, as you said, you know, the place has seen so much and I wish, you know, spaces can speak uh, and, and tell stories as beautifully as you did. Uh, but, but, what, but how, you know, restoring paintings is an art by itself. Um, can you, can we speak a little bit about that? What sure. are the ways to conserve uh, our heritage and what can we do? Right. Thank you, Vikram, for that very, I think that's a very important question because, um, see, all of us as as historians people would write about this in a in a in a say in a narrative or a, or a book right so this history is recorded as a chronicler they would chronicle the life of saratullah khan and there would this this moment will feature as one of the many moments just like how the chronicles of say akbar or anybody else right and then of course there are the local histories of saint thomas church itself right so the history really gets embedded in different fragments uh, in oral traditions and written traditions. And then artists and uh, uh, you know people who are interested in Renaissance painting would quote saying, once upon a time, there were these, these were one of the earliest Renaissance commissions in India, right? So we have lost every trace of it, right? But the, the it was moment would always feature in works that speak about the Renaissance work. And then of course the music, the Urdu poetry and all of that, for example, I researched on the Urdu poetry with the uh, the um, descendants of Sadatullah Khan's court poets here, and that's how I I came across all of these Urdu poetry. So, so we are each doing our thing, but the way to interweave this honestly, and the purpose of that interwovenness is to really bring, if possible, this back to life. Failing which, the closest we have is the poetry and its story narration that can at least give us a mind's eye view of what brilliance this would have been. Honestly, the Chronicle speaks of the, the glory of those Renaissance, the colors bursting, you know, the, the faces coming alive, the, the, the breaking free of those two dimensional figures into those multi-dimensional figures where, you know, the face of baby Jesus and all of that just coming alive. And the record of that, the Chronicle is just so vivid. And look at us, we have a white lime plastered wall. So what can we do? And that's where science interweaves, chemistry interweaves into this entire dialogue. Because otherwise, people would think that this is historical and therefore it's a moment of the past, right? It, it, not, it, it need not be. So what I have endeavored to do is uh, use uh, the example of a recent restoration of ceiling paintings done at Lepakshi Temple, the Rupaksha Temple in Lepakshi. And I'm going to talk about the chemical process just a little bit so that you know we understand what what role can people play in such a history what role can a scientist or a chemist play in such a such a moment right so i'm just going to read out what i've written so what we first need is a scaffolding first of all you know restoration doesn't happen like that people just do a very ad hoc arbitrary job so you need a proper scaffolding so that the materials are kept properly there and then they would start looking at how to unpeel the lime plaster first, because that is the that is the, the menace. It's just white walls right now, right? So that task of unpeeling the lime plaster will need very, very, because the lime plaster is an oily matter and it's associated with containing acidic, acidic matter because it's lime. So, you know, they will have to peel it off 
so that the painting do does not come in contact with acidic matter and it will remain as much as it can with, with the clean surface. So such a layer of acidic matter, okay, needs a, a solvent that is alkaline in nature. And so they will have to use an alkaline, um, I think it's called a tre trethanolanamin. No, wait, hold on. Trethanolanamin. Okay, that is the solution that they would use. And they would actually plaster a thin layer of tissue and then apply this and wait for it to dry because this particular chemical has the agency to seep in slowly and therefore it will slowly peel off the layer and slowly work at the layer without seeping into the original painting if it is there underneath the lime plaster. Usually people when they um, either apply a lime plaster or paint over, they just paint over, they don't scrap it out. Right? So it's painted over, they would have applied a, a, a general coat and they would have applied lime plaster or whatever that they wanted to uh, cover it up with. Uh, that's how we've restored many paintings around many monuments in India. Right. And since the layer is, um, you know, since the tissue, paper, you know, has to like dry and then this particular solution has to uh, seep into the lime plaster, after which they will use um, gentle cotton swabs, big swabs of cotton to roll out the tissue, uh, along with dipping the cotton swab in petroleum spirit. So that's a very, very sort of nuanced process, following which they will at least apply some two, three quarts of 1% solution of polyvinyl acetate, PVA, in toluene solution, right? So this is a preservative. Now, this preservative really helps keep the paintings bright. Uh, allow that glossy finish and also whatever deposits further you may have of dust and pollution and all of that will only deposit on this layer. So every few years you'll have to go back and only remove this surface while the painting stays intact. So this is a very scientific process that really requires the, the uh, uh, you know, the combination of people from say preserva conservation, heritage conservation, people with good knowledge of how to use chemicals in the right proportion and historians and artistic eyes that can speak, that can tell you how to restore it. I'll give you a classic example, the Brihadishwara temple in Tanjavur, they did a temple renovation of one slab. They did it with just masons because they thought it's architectural work and this is UNESCO monument. Okay, they ended up putting one slab over the other after restoration, except the first slab was upside down and the second was on in order. So today you have a, you have an entire pillar, which you read like this, and then you have to read like this because they've, they had no idea. There were no historians, there were no artists. So these are some of the other disciplines that you really require to bring all of this together. Thank you. You know, that was, that was a live example of introvertness, right? So a poet, a poet, an artist, a performer talking about chemistry and chemicals, I don't know. Usually faculty members shy away from subjects that they don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but so much of, of that you know, and thank you uh, for answering that. And and what about the angle of sustainability? Like, like you know, when we talk of all this art restoration, uh, are people conscious of, of their actions? Are people conscious of what they're doing uh, or the effect of what they're doing on the environment? That's actually, a, that's again a very important angle, right? I mean, we can all speak uh, gung-ho about history and all of these interwovenness and the chemical reaction and all that, but ultimately it all boils down to political will. So there is a very strong contemporary political angle and that boils down to understanding the location of every monument or anything that you endeavor to preserve or conserve, right? For example, the St. Thomas Church is located at St. Thomas Mount, which used to be a, an individual assembly constituency up until 1971. And our famous then Chief Minister, uh, M.G. Ramachandran, contested twice from that constituency and won. However, after 1971, for political reasons, it was uh, combined with the Alandur constituency, which is now, you know, near the airport. Many people would know the Alandur station in Madras, right? Result of which, because it is now part of a larger constituency, it doesn't have as much political power. You know, you know what I mean? So Palangi Malay as such, the, 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 the hill and the communities that live around that, mostly the Anglo-Indian community, the Armenian, you know, the, the, the Danes, Dutch, Portuguese and Armenians who settled there. All their descendants today are collectively known as Anglo-Indians. They're a very unique community. And uh, uh, historian S. Mutaya has done extensive work with them over the years. 
But one thing they haven't been able to do in Tamil Nadu, and this is the reality of Chennai, is they haven't been even able to have a community center for the Anglo-Indian community from the government. Right now, so there are documentaries about this where Delhi and Bangalore and Goa, of course, has a lot of these community community centers. What does a community center do? It brings the community together. You know, it brings them together to look at their history, to, you know, to not be fragmented, to start thinking about sustainability, to start thinking about conservation. Right. Right now, they are very fragmented because there is no political will to bind them together because it's not an important constituency. So you see, it all boils down to current day politics. So ultimately, this vast history and Urdu poetry and all my Mujhe Malum Natha will boil down to who is being elected as the local MLA. So I, as an artist, if I want to engage with this history, have to engage with that politics, failing which I will only be talking in thin air whether it's me or whether it's an institution like even INTAC who work with conservation, ultimately INTAC will have all the great historians on their panel, but they'll have to go haggle with the local MLA. That's the politics and political angle that we also need to take into consideration. Thank you. Uh, what a simple answer, right? <laughs> yeah. but, but... <laughs> but I think the problems that we face today are so complex. I mean, you know, knowledge of just one thing is never going to help you. I mean, look at the current situation, right? Uh, but now, you know, can we speak of the interwovenness of such a narration? I mean, can we really do that? Yeah, I think, I mean, if it hasn't been apparent already, you know, I mean, just to sort of jog our memories, let's just look at the the different disciplines that we have managed to touch. I know I asked people to just keep a year out for the various disciplines and knowledge streams that one might need to weave this together. Whether it's a whether we look at it as a historical point of view or an artistic endeavor or a restoration point of view or sustainability and community point of view, right? So there is history, of course, colonial and Mughal history and all of that. Then there's a study of history of the monument itself. The history of the Apostle St. Thomas, and then the renovation of that particular, the various renovation stages of that particular church, etc. Then, of course, there's a cultural study angle where you have the cuisine of the British. When I say curry, it's true because curry is a very generic British term that we don't know of. India and Indians didn't know of, not even the Mughals. We, we don't call it curry. We call it by different names. We call it Rogan Ghost and we call it different that. We don't ever, so the curry is a very generic term, right? So cuisines, the Nawab's cuisine, the Armenian cuisine. So we're looking at culinary uh, cultures. Then we're looking at languages. There was Urdu, they spoke Sanskrit, they spoke, of course, Armenian, they would have spoken Portuguese, they would have spoken English. So you're looking at a situation in which, in a given situation, at least five languages, clothes, customs, you know, somebody saying Salam, somebody else saying Subhanallah, somebody else saying Ba, Sabash, all of that. Then there's travel history. How did they move between Arkad, which is farther away from Chennai, to uh, St. Thomas Mount, to Saint Fort St. George, which is here now in the Secretariat, current Secretariat. How did they move the horses, the various ways in which people traveled? And then there is, of course, art and the Renaissance, European art itself that traveled to, to India, through whom, how, when, where, and the science behind Renaissance art and the history of India and absorbing Renaissance art. Then the Mushera, the poetic symposium that had multiple languages like Tamil, Sanskrit, and Urdu. Uh, then we have layers of music, dance, and of course the story narration, which are used as mediums to sort of, they sang, right? They sang, I, I, the dance was an extra layer that I added, but um, you know, the, Kanchan, the Kanchanese in Kanchanwada did dance to this poetry later, right? And then of course the scientific chemical, chemical composition of restoration angle, political background of St. Thomas Mount and sustainability of heritage and heritage projects. Finally, the loss of cultural history. If, if these aren't there, then what else can be interwoven, right? Wow. I, mean, I don't even know what to say after that, right? Uh, but I think a lot of questions, uh, you know, Swarna Maria, we get about, uh, you know, just being an artist or being a performer, right? I mean, um, you know, the, you know, there's this universal debate of of people uh, who say, you know, art cannot be taught, or you know, you are a born artist, uh, you know, or you, you know, like I don't know how much of that can be taught to somebody. So, what is your opinion on that? Like somebody. 
doctor, somebody who's getting mixed signals about having interest in multiple things, what should they do? And, and can really art be taught? Art, art, if you want to absorb it in a very generic way, then everything is art. The science of coding is art, right? So the chemical restoration, if it's not done in the right proportion, it's art. And that proportion is artistic. Right. So anything that is proportionate, anything that brings out the desired result is artistic and therefore everything is an element of art. Right. That said, the idea of art in the Indian system, as well as I think world over, at least definitely in the Indian system, you would never hear anybody say art is innate and, you know, you need to have a eye for it, etc. Here, for the longest time, at least 2500 years of an intellectual legacy we inherit in this country, uh, where disagreements, uh, constant debates, contrarian views, and real, real sort of intellectual engagement with artistic pedagogies has been part of our legacy. Whether it be with the visual arts, poetry and literature, or the performing arts. It's amazing how much from starting, I mean, I'm saying starting because that is one of the starting points, but say a Nati Shastra, which is one of the dramaturgical works that we have, to you know, the Tamil literature and the different linguistic literatures. Why Indus Valley civilization has so much of an artistic tradition. The Mohenjo-daro girl, if she is to be identified by archaeologists as a dancer, imagine how much um, art had a role to play, right? So the idea that art has a pedagogy and that we can speak about it, we can learn it, there's a formula even to appreciating art. They teach us, we, we also are taught how to appreciate art because if you, one thing is to be taken in by wow the other is to actually know the nuance and there are all these elements that help you get there so art is very much a feasible uh, you know endeavor both as a practitioner as well as a connoisseur thank you you know i'm i'm being so selfish by asking all the questions myself and i have like a hundred more questions now uh, but i'm going to stop my questions and take questions from the chat i think it's only fair uh, so the first question is from uh, suryan nathan prabhu he's a student uh, at kc high he asks how did the colonization of india by british uh, affect our culture today uh, okay that's a that's a fairly vast question uh if you were to go if you i'm, I'm sure you would have read sashi Tharoor's, uh, works and you know of course multiple multiple directions in which we have we have engaged with colonial history really but all of uh, one of the i think one of the things that i'd like to place here is that we always think all of all of history is in some way colonial production i think that is one thing that uh, people like romila tapar later on have very beautifully contended with. Um, so our idea that history, India was an ahistorical world. India lived in an ahistorical world. And that the idea of history was brought to us by the British. I think just that and the breaking of that myth by showcasing uh, those literatures and those evidence that we have here within the country uh, to show us that we have been historical. We are not ahistorical. We didn't have to wait for uh, William Jones to come and talk to us about uh, history or anybody else to pinpoint the today the what we understand as political history and the written interpretative history. I think when that was done, I think it was a great moment for us to also understand. For example, the way I approached history today was through literature. My window to Sadatullah Khan's chronicle was through the Urdu poetry. In typical historical terms, if you were to do a Western understanding of this, they would say that the Urdu poetry is ahistorical because it, it may give you, it may lend you certain evidence. For example, it may allude or it may even directly talk about Sadatullah Khan, but it, it is not permissible evidence within historical understanding. But that is a British or a colonial understanding. We have moved far away from that, thanks to uh, the great minds within our academics, right? So today I would say that uh, I think we have, we should have a good partnership, if anything, with the, with the British ways of thinking. We have definitely inherited a lot of their methodologies academically, customarily, and otherwise. So there's no point in sitting on our high horse and saying we are completely over our colonial, uh, colonial, I won't even call it a hangover. I think 
these are this is how cultures permeate right so so uh, we can't say hey we are completely back to being indian because that's a very different perspective it takes you into a very different political ide ideology uh, but uh, it's also true that we've had a tremendous amount of work that's gone into understanding much of our uh, treasures say indian culture as such if we can call it that i don't even believe in the concept of india that's another story right but <laughs> but uh, i think we've, we've managed to get through that as well i don't know if that answered your question yes, yes it did. Uh, so you know that again um, you know we have all kinds of audiences uh, so usually there's this question that comes from either teachers or counselors whenever we're to doing a topic. So we did one on writing and they were like, how do we make writing more interesting for students? And I think it's fair for them to ask this question to experts like you. Uh, so there, uh, there is Miss uh, Gurmeet Kaur. Uh, I think she's from Indore and we have another counselor or a teacher, uh, Chetna Sabrawal. Both of them are asking, uh, saying how do, and she's from Jodhpur and this from Indore. So they are asking, how do we make history more interesting? Uh, how do we teach history in a more interesting way so that you know children engage uh, and they learn and they love that's, the subject? That's my favorite question ever. I'll tell you why. Because uh, I didn't study history uh, uh, in my. I mean, that is, I studied history in school uh, in my later, like a higher secondary. I did advanced history, but when I went to college, I did sociology because I was drawn to the social sciences, humanities, really. Uh, and then, of course, from there on, I moved to performance his, performance studies, which brought me right back to history because I was looking at, you know, the histories of performance and I was looking at people and cultures. And so, you know, and then somewhere in between, I realized that I was also very, very interested in political history. But because I did not have formal training in political history and uh, real historians will tell you that you need to you need to have those trainings, you know, certain apparatus trainings. And I was actually interestingly having this conversation with one of our history colleagues yesterday. I said my window, you know, to history would be through archaeology, where, you know, children, if I want to address children or even young people, why are young people, even adults, right? When you go to a place, when you see how soil, land and rubble and stones and small pieces of pottery and just broken bangles and beads can tell you the story of people, can connect your own self and your own uh, generations to these cultures, right? The language people speak, the kinds of clothes people wear, the kinds of jewelry they, they wear, all of this is history. So if we can start looking at history, history through music, through dance, through cultures, mostly through communities and cultures and archeology, span I think those are fantastic gateways to falling in love forever with history because honestly history is part of our life it would be a very sad world if we don't have history and to say that history is not important is like saying i'm not important <laughs> that's very well put uh, and thank you uh, so there's amrita rudra uh, she is She's obviously very, very active. She's sent in a lot of questions in the chat. She says, hello, professor, would you mind summarizing the story from the point they decided to have a poetry symposium? I don't know whether you want to take this question, Swarna, but. Well, I can just say it in a couple of lines. So they went on to say, they went on to like sing poetry in Urdu, Sanskrit, and maybe a couple of lines in Tamil as well. I performed a few, I translated a few of that in English for you, Urdu and uh, Sanskrit poetry. And I performed in the end, one piece, Mujay Malum Natha, which is a Urdu poetry, um, which spoke about the beauty of one of the biblical paintings, etc. So, so yes, and that's how the evening ended. The evening was one to remember. That's it. Thank you. Uh, so there is uh, Tarani Kapoor. Uh, Tarani says, I'm a student of grade 10th in uh, modern school Vasant Vihar in New Delhi. My question is, after restoration, how is it ensured that the paintings are not uh, degenerated by further exposure to air or human vandalism? I think that's a very important question. Yes, I think that's a great question that brings both the chemical restoration process as well as uh, sustainability, you know, that we were talking about and community uh, together. So for the first part of the question, as I said, you know, when they when they those two layers of uh, polyvalent acetate solution, 
uh, what it does is that that solution you if you go to any of the fresco i mean temples or any monuments really where the frescoes have been restored and uh, I think uh, preserved. Ajanta is one such place. So if you go, you will see. I mean, they it came. That restoration also came after much degeneration. We woke up rather late, but nevertheless, it's it's been preserved now. This, if you see that layer, those two coats or three coats that they apply, all the sediments of pollution and dirt will assimilate on that. You can't stop that, right? Because it's a church, people will come. If it's the ceiling, then, you know, you know, if there's going to be, and you know, here in South India, the churches replicate a lot of the customs like the temples. So you have them burning campers sometimes and this, that and the other. So it's bound to get sued. It's bound to get pollution and all of that. And it's on a hillock. So naturally, those atmospheric um, altitudinal things are also going to affect. However, every three years and four years, so that's where the sustainability comes. If you are able to re-restore it, then all you have to do is take those layers of uh, preservation that you have done with the uh, acetate, poly polyvinyl acetate, and re-coat. That's really what you have to do. Sometimes if certain aspects, certain parts of the painting has peeled off or, you know, there's plaster, usually frescoes are done with a plaster, lime, you know, uh, uh, wet plaster. We don't have that technology anymore, definitely not for Renaissance painting. Then you will get a really good artist to touch up without knowing that it's been touched up. And then you recoat it. That's really the process. As for how to not allow people to vandalize, that's where community comes in, right? So if you don't have a strong community, if you don't have the support of the political system, then I can give you n number of examples of fantastic monuments where people go they smuggle a piece of charcoal in their hands and write their name, say, Hari loves Divya. What pleasure they get out of it, no one will know. But, and this is not a particular sort of, you know, category of people. This is a lot of people. Okay, they, I've seen people dig the eyes out of, the eye part out of a fresco painting of a beautiful, you know, Buddha. So that you need community support. One of the questions that I had, uh, Swana, and I'll go back to the questions from the chat, uh, but there is a lot of work that is happening uh, around the world. I mean, when you go to beautiful, beautiful museums, especially in the West, there's so much work to bring in storytelling, you know, uh, museums, you know, I, wherever I've gone in Europe, I mean, they always have that recorder, right? And they have, you go there, you point, and there's a story that comes. Um, and I think, you know, like whenever I've gone to monuments, seen things, if there's a guide, I think that whole journey becomes different, right? You get into the, somebody else's life, you think like them. So storytelling is clearly a very, very important uh, part, right? But what if, what about careers? Now, when you talk of 21st century careers, how do you think storytelling is important for somebody who wants to do economics or yeah. somebody who wants to do, you know, literature, literature, obviously, but, but something else? You know, that's a great question, right? So what are probably the, so given this story narration, right? What are the possible career options? Let's just sort of, you know, think like that, right? So obvious ones are, of course, historian and archaeologist and conservation, da, 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 da. Advertising. Uh, advertising, art, etc. right? Tourism, politician, you say, all of that. So, you know, it's a, it's a place of power, I right? I answer politician because I think it's all about storytelling in, in politics. Oh, yeah. And it's a job, <laughs> not a service. service anymore. Right, but so that is one. But uh, the, the, the ones that don't meet the eye, for example, you, you know, you, you spoke about museums and how museums have these audio tours and all that. India has also, in some places, have, has begun these audio tours. But India has a very different economy. We must also remember that we have a long tradition of oral narration. And these oral narrators, although they may not always be very factual, and that's not their fault, you know, I mean, they've had to spice things up. It's like, I can think of that, that first scene in uh, that, uh, what's that movie, that Jeho film, right? Where those kids masala fi the Taj Mahal, right? So, you know, that's typically, you'll get a lot of guides like that, you know, young children and older people. I remember I recently went to Bodh Gaya and I knew about Bodh Gaya because I've studied the history of, uh, uh, you know, Ashoka and the monument itself, but there were at least five of them sort of peddling to come with me and explain the place to me, but that's economy. That's their economics. That's how 
life thrived around uh, monuments and tourist sites. So I think that's again political will, right? We have to start building an economy around tourism. And we need to equip these people with facts. Maybe we can also equip them with technology that can make our experience and their own learning process more, um, more uh, interesting. Imagine you had a historic, so I wouldn't advocate that we, we because this is labor, right? And this is job market. So I wouldn't advise that we chuck all of them and get audio guides. But what if we use that technology with these people? What if they can sing and recite poetry? And what if we train them? So there are some training centers around India for tourists, tour guides and all that. So I think we need to look at these as potential job markets, right? This is a fantastic, I mean, for anybody who wants to do soft skill, I mean, imagine you just go there, you have knowledge of history and art and restoration you would be imagine you say the story that i say to people there they'd, they'd be floored and you show them you know you use a little bit of technology maybe there's an app that takes you around whatever gives you a virtual tour or takes you into a performance so there are n number of possibilities i think what we need is to wear a creative cap and the political will thank you uh, so we have sonali money uh, she's from the riverside public school Kotagiri, of course a very very beautiful place uh, so she's an educator there. She says being an actress, an anchor, a classical dancer to a researcher and to a teacher, how did the journey go? Uh, is there a particular reason that you've, you've done all of this? Uh, there is no particular reason why, and there is no chronology to this list, right? So, I mean, I was a classical dancer, or at least I started learning at the age of three. Um, so I started performing when I was 12 and I have been, uh, you know, engaged with the arts, music and dance ever since. So that's something that I, I know even better than walking and eating as a child. So that, that was one. So everything else started interweaving with that. So the idea that films and media happened felt like an allied engagement in the arts. My, because I learned with hereditary dance gurus and, uh, you know, these were women from the hereditary community of artists. And I was very fortunate to learn with them from the age of three, just looking at their lives and the fact that uh, my own home provided me uh, a strong uh, sort of background in feminism and the idea of looking at women and their lives really piqued my interest in looking into their performance histories and their current sociocultural lives, etc. So there began, began my interest in the academic aspect of dance. Uh, and of course, my interest in looking at the lost performances and therefore the communities that went with it and really the loss of culture and cultural transfer. Uh, that was the other aspect. And uh, teaching is a natural extension of everything. You know, it's, it's more than teaching. I call myself a facilitator because uh, uh, it's it's the sharing. I mean, I've been under the tutelage and continue to be with such uh, generous mentors. And you know, you you won't you'd be surprised for my doctoral dissertation. Although the work was uh, under the discipline of performance studies and dance, most of my mentors came from archaeology and history and uh, chemical whatever, and all of them from different disciplines, literature. So none of them directly into dance, but that's really the view you need to be able to plow deeper. So I think, uh, so that's really the sum total of why I landed up doing all of these things. And I, I can't, I don't see any of this as one and the other. It's really one big mix, happy mix. Great of questions left but and we have 15 minutes to go but we'll try to i mean take your time to answer these uh, so the next question is from uh, sarthak sood uh, sarthak is a student at uh, the sanskar valley school in bhopal and he asked please uh, shed light upon theater and cinema's development uh, in human history because they are also evolved forms of uh, visual arts theater and cinema that's interesting i mean uh, theater um, has a very long history, of course. Uh, one that we'll have to uh, one that we'll have to go all the way back to the idea of theatrical um, theatrical productions and dramaturgy, at least as far as Indian theatrical traditions go. So one that will need us to travel back, like I said, at least 2,000, 2,500 years into understanding how Greek Greek theatrical 
conditions had an impression on us? How did we look at uh, theatrical productions within the Indian um, ethos, the idea of aesthetics and poetics that has contributed tremendously to the idea of theatrics, mm, and um, and visual visual. I wouldn't say that visual narrative or visual art has pushed theater. These have been two very distinct but giving sort of giving art forms, right? We have a so therefore to say that theater has a very long history. Not not something that I can cover in this uh, conversation. But cinema, though, cinema came in, uh, you know, fairly uh, late into our um, into our history. You know, it's. It's technology, something that the British uh, brought with them. We started dabbling with cinema and uh, cinema came from theater. So cinema came from all the hereditary performing artists. Uh, like I was saying, the, here in the South, you call them Isai Velalar or you call them the community uh, in a more uh, uh, understandable colloquial manner. The courtesan community uh, in the North, the Tawaifs, the Kanchanis, the Devadasis, these were the women uh, who were the first artists. Apart from them, of was of course the early theatrical groups, right? For example, in South, I can tell you that there was a company called the Boys Company. Parsi theater, the Parsi community had so such a huge role to play in in moving theater into such a main space, and it was this community uh, that really pushed uh, Bollywood cinema. If you if you look at Manto, the film, right, Nadita Das's film, you will understand that the Parsi community had a tremendous, and of course the Pakistan, now the Pakistanis, but once Indians had a lot of a role to play in shaping theatre into cinema. And the same was here in South as well. We had the Parsi community here. The Boys Company was largely the pa the Parsi theatre, the Prithviraj theatre, and all of that, whose extensions we had here in the South. Shivaji Ganesan, the great joy of an actor here in the South, came from the Boys Company. Shankar Das Swamigal was a great poet uh, in South who wrote plays after plays, theatrical plays that were converted into cinema. So cinema, early cinema is theater in many ways. But theater itself in India has a huge long history. I think we should have another, another full discussion for that. But but just an uh, just an extension of a question to this uh, to this answer of yours, I think theater you know theaters changed the way theaters really changed right. I mean initially we know that there were community theaters, many of them were you know they had strong messages uh, and and things like that. To now where theaters sort of perceived a little um, you know like it's exclusive, it's expensive, uh, it might not be accessible for everyone. What is your take on on that? I think uh, that is one form of theater that you and I who live in the urban are more exposed to. I think that's the reality of one form of theater. But theater has such an intrinsic role to play in the lives of our communities. Even today, the, the Nautanki Natakas and the different kinds of the, the Ojapalis and the different traditional theater forms, Terukuta here in the South, for example, or Kuriyatam or any of the theatrical forms, uh, Teyam, you know, which are all musical dance theater forms and also pure theater, street theater forms continue to exist in their beautiful pockets, very pristine, very, you know, sort of very, it's got a lovely legacy, it's got its own audience, but it still exists and very accessible, right? So I think we have lost access to those things because we have moved to the urban and for us, theater means the English theater perhaps largely and, you know, those, those uh, theatrical forms, those are much later for us. But India has a vast area of theatrical communities that still exist. For example, Sadatullah Khan's, um, this I, I would have to say this, right? So uh, Joseph Collette, who was the governor of uh, Madras during Sadatullah Khan's time, he had endowed an entire village near Tiruvatriur uh, called uh, Collette Peta. Okay, and that was endowed for painters and artists and theater artists to inhabit that entire village and produce artwork. So the British really followed our model of patronizing the arts. Whether they knew, they thought that was one way of being main Saab, being Khan, being Saab. Thank you. Uh, so this Kabir, Dinesh Kabir, yes, we are asking your question. Uh, he's typed in, I mean, five, six times. But Kabir, thank you for the question. Uh, so he's a student at uh, Satya Sai School in Indore, and he asks, uh, uh, what is Mycenaean art and why is Persian art famous? Very particular question, but. Yeah. So Persian art is one of the earliest, for, uh, well, I must uh, 
tell you, Kabir, that I'm no art historian as such. We have a wonderful faculty with us, Shrajana, who is, uh, uh, you know, uh, her, she works on art restoration and she's an art historian. She may be a better person to uh, really speak about this. But, um, you know, the, some of the early colors that we get, uh, the pigments that we have in frescoes uh, and the, the, the quintessential um, strokes, uh, you know, are uh, Persian uh, origins for us. And you will see those later on, of course, embedded in the Mughal art, translated into the Vijayanagara and also, you know, here in the south, you will see that as Kalam or what we now call as Kalamkari, right? So these strokes and these specific colors, indigo in particular, and some of the vegetable colors. So these make, and the strokes as such, make Persian art very unique and, uh, and very different. So I wouldn't really comment any, any further on that because that's all I know for now. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is from Balaji. Uh, he's a regular in our uh, webinars. He's actually uh, Swarna, an accepted student, and he's coming to you next year. Uh, so he is from the Lotus Valley International School in Noida, uh, and he asks, how creative can we get by exploring the socio-political aspects um, of historic historical times? Uh, I don't know what exactly you mean by socio-political, uh, but I'm guessing you're, lo you're looking at the economic, uh, cultural, that sort of analysis, right? And that's what I'm guessing you are referring to. Uh, more than creative, yes, definitely creative. You must get creative with the solutions you're looking for. So one of the things that Kriya we talk about is solutions for the 21st century problems. These are the 21st century problems. Vandalism is our 21st century problem. But a draconian law, which we already have, is of no use, right? I mean, I've gone dime a dozen to monuments where they vandalized and there's a watchman there who's uni and sitting there with no voice and agency to to enforce the law, right? So, so you do need creative ways of sensitizing people. So creativity has a role to play in the socio-economic or the socio-cultural uh, engagement with uh, conservation uh, or sustainability. But before that, I think we also need something else. We need sensitivity and empathy. I think I would put that ahead of creativity because sometimes creativity alone can be a very lonely uh, and a very, uh, elitist and for the lack of a better word, a very arrogant approach to solutions. Sometimes our solutions may not be the solutions that the community needs or the, the culture as such may need, right? We may think that a particular a custom or a particular thing is more important to be preserved or more important to be erased. But what about voices from within the community? So what about, and that we call a subaltern understanding and, you know, so it goes back to other sort of cultural understanding. So I think I put the front and center of any socio-political or socio-cultural engagement as empathy and sensitivity followed or accompanied with creativity. Thank you. Uh, so there's uh, Sarakshi Tiwari. Uh, she asks us, how can we make our country more sustainable with arts and, um, and make people aware, make the countrymen aware of, of the arts? It's a very uh, open-ended question. Yes. No, I think a uh, better part of that the answer to that question lies at home, right? So how much, how many times have we gone to a monument or have we evinced interest in going to these places as opposed to say a mall or a, or a film theater? Not to say that those are not important places to go. I mean, I'm not a prude in that sense. We need all kinds of uh, entertainment and development on the one hand. On the other, how important or how possible is it under the current socio-economic pressures that the country faces for, is for us to stay focused on preserving monuments as opposed to not letting our people die right so we are in a place where we are we have to make those choices so so we have to really place all of this in a larger context that said yesterday i heard a very disturbing news that um, all the ngos that work in the art sector for example a new a new uh, order from the government states that no csr funding to them would be accounted for as csr which means art funding is getting slashed india in a country where government has almost very, very little art funding, it's further getting slashed from private 
private uh, donors. So we are also looking at policy level changes. So we must go for this from the, like I said, the political policy angle. We must look at it from the humanitarian community angle. We must look at it from the restoration angle. We must also look at it from the historic angle and the artistic angle. It's, it's only the collective that will give us any solution. Thank you. Swana Mario, we'll just take the last two questions, one from the chat and one uh, which is my question, <laughs> if you may. Uh, so this uh, Mr. Saurabh Tiwari, he's an educator at uh, Inventure Academy in Bangalore. Uh, so he's asked a question saying, how has the concept of high art and low art influenced sustainable forms? That's a very uh, important question, but one that uh, I think we have to collectively ask, um, ask our political dispensation and our nation state producers or, you know, so to speak, uh, like I said, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'll speak. I think I'll give you a quick example of the performing arts. For example, in the 1950s, early 1950s, right after uh, in post independence, there was the Sangeet Natak Academy that was established to preserve Sangeeta and Nataka, obviously the performing art traditions. They did something to categorize all the performing arts under, of course, state-wise categorization of Tamil Nadu, da, 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 because until then we did not, the nation state was just fresh and newly produced, right, uh, in those early years. And then they also did something else. They went, in, they went ahead and categorized art forms as folk and traditional, or classical. And then they gave certain markers for classical and certain markers for folk. And somehow over time, we have come, we have come to call something as classical and folk. This high and low markers have crept into our minds. So we say, oh, it's very folkish. As a folk, you know, is something low. Right? we've all gotten into that habit, right? And, uh, uh, and Sangeet Natak Academy has also gotten into that habit through its policy, because you will see that for the same government uh, gig, a classical artist would be paid four times more than a folk artist. So these are the places where this disparity is embedded. It's easier to work with the people's mind because you, once you see the splendor of the art forms, it's very easy to, to break that, especially in the young, but it's the policy level change. If so, if as academicians and as people interested in involving, and these are all avenues that are open for, for people who want to work with the economic aspect of art and art production and, and policy making, et cetera. Right? So those are the inherent problems we have. Some of the inherent. Thank you. Uh, and the final question, of course, uh, and we end with this. Uh, Swarna, I think, what is your message to all the students, uh, you know, who are logging in? You know, many of them, you know, the current situation is obviously forcing them to think, rethink their career choices. Uh, we know that the world is changing at a pace like never before. Um, so, so the message, I mean, for somebody who's looking at music, I mean, should they go into a pure music school um, or somebody who's looking at Bharatanatyam? Should they go to a music or dance academy or should they, you know, what, what, what is the message that you would like to give to everybody who's listening to you? Right. Um, so, I mean, those are two slightly different questions. So if somebody is wants to practice the arts, wants to learn the arts and be a practitioner of any form, music, dance or painting or whatever, and if you want to be an artist, a practitioner, you need sustained, very focused and long term practice and learning. So that means riyas and learning and, you know, whatever it may be, whichever art form. Right. So if you want to be a practitioner, but that is not the only option in today's day and age. We have so many avenues in and around any particular profession. I'm not even talking only about the arts, given any any discipline. You know, you may be a practitioner of that discipline, but you may also have these allied areas in which there are tremendous, uh, there is a tremendous scope for uh, a job production. Now I'll come to the, the, the generic question of what, what would I like to say, right? I mean, we can't talk of a post COVID world because we are still in COVID and God knows for how long. That said, it's a very uncertain world. But in many ways, this is the uncertain world we are, we've all been inhabiting. It's not, our lives have been slightly better because we've stepped out and we've been able to do some of the social things that has been curtailed. The economy was crashing. You know, our lives were in many ways uh, under the scanner. It was questionable. Our health, when I say ours, it means our migrant labors and the people around us, their health was always uh, very, very precarious. So 
the idea of uh, an unprecedented or an extraordinary situation as it may seem also means that uh, we should think differently right so yes the traditional choices are very easy to to go and grab and they feel like secure but now is the time to take the risk and i say risk because if you until you feel comfortable you know so the jobs out there if they are drying up you know you have to start cre thinking creatively and i think it's those creative minds that very often sustain and learn to it's very much the mind right ultimately so if you feel like you can't sustain and tied through this moment no matter how what what much how much of a high paying job you are in you're going to be a nervous wreck so i think emotionally all of us have to ready ourselves to feel creative to feel like we can wear multiple hats and for we to equip ourselves so this sort of this idea of the interwovenness helps us equip ourselves in areas in which we are not already comfortable but are willing to explore and i think that allowing ourselves to explore is very very important because god knows what the next few years or decades is going to demand out of humanity and if we want to be helpful to both ourselves and our community which is very important uh, you know which is which ultimately gives you the purpose for being who we are uh, we have to wear multiple hats and so instead of looking at a few people and saying hey wow you 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 wear multiple hats but i can only just do one i think we all have to give up that insularity and learn to sort of hold hands and learn from each other and look look forward to the unprecedented world because that's the world we're already inhabiting thank you thank you uh, and uh, thank you for that wonderful session swarna and i think uh, you know we are pouring in with messages which are people are thanking you uh, and um, yeah, very very positive messages uh, but thank you really swarna for doing this for us and taking time uh, i know you're busy i know you're teaching i know you do uh, you know a million other things um, along with everything that you do so thank you so much for uh, giving us the time today thank you so much to you and to kanchi and the it team ranjit and the whole team uh, for being uh, i mean i think for bringing us closer to our potential students and academic ad academics around uh, from different parts of india right it's always wonderful for us to hear back from them thank you for having me